Well, thanks everybody. I think we'll get started and everyone's welcome no matter when they show up. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Lisa in particular for this and, and, uh, and Diane for uh, helping motivate this. It's uh, Friday afternoon and we didn't really have this you know, planned uh, months out or anything. This is a pretty spontaneous opportunity for people to catch up a little bit on this subject because it's such a promising opportunity. We were uh, knocked out when we did the tour, the uh, digital tour that's available on the small arms buildings uh, uh, site. And uh, maybe we'll get Sherry to put that link up. And we may even, if people are interested, do a little tour. It's outstanding. It gives you an idea of the tremendous range of available spaces. So again, very grateful that uh, Lisa and Diane can be here. And uh, to get us started, I think uh, I'd like to just introduce Diane. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with the Small Arms Society over the years and what it started to do and then it's morphed or evolved, I should say, into uh, Creative Hub 1352. And Diane, I think, has been there from day one and is the current executive director of Creative Hub 1352. And what your goals are, and, and you're so invested in this building, maybe you can get us started with some thoughts about the building itself, your goals, your role, and, and uh, what your hopes are. Diane? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Mike. And my thank you to you for uh, hosting it for, and uh, also to have Lisa and her team on the call as well. And um, we've been involved with um, the Small Arms Inspection Building for well over, uh, it's almost 12 years now. And uh, we were the organization and those who came before me were the ones that um, uh, saved the building from uh, demolition. And, and since then it's evolved into a, uh, a, a wonderful space that the city has purchased. And, and we are there as one of their partners to uh, develop programming and uh, ensure that we've got good community engagement and par participation. So um, our role is, is one to help advocate for that and to work with the community and to help continue to build out the arts and culture heritage programming. And we also work in the environmental portfolio as well. So um, we have uh, all been affected by COVID and this last year was particularly challenging for everyone. And, uh, certainly had an impact in terms of our um, ability to host events and programs as well. Um, wonderful to see that the city is initiating the feasibility study and the review of the north end of the building. Uh, we see that as the probably the most important aspect of the building in the sense that more artists and those who have a, a, a creative talents can use that space uh, for uh, their own craft and, and uh, work that they do in the community to really create that hub and creative experience uh, through collaboration and connecting with others. And so uh, we've been working closely with the city of Mississauga on, on this venture and fully support them and doing what we can in terms of uh, making recommendations and suggestions as to how the space could uh, be used and what the functions could be of the space. Each year or every two years, we've hosted in situ, so which is a multi um, arts festival, and I hope many of you have had a chance to be to uh, to them. Uh, we, this will be our third uh, event coming up, and um, in the past, we've been intimate with with the building in its raw form, and um, uh, we're probably fortunate enough uh, to to know of the space uh, uh, as well as anyone, but. Uh, having a chance to be in it and work in the space certainly gives us a good idea of what the, the capacity uh, would be for its, for its use for the community. Um, I'm just gonna close off uh, on that. I'm very curious and excited to hear people uh, and come on today and share their thoughts about it. Um, as a community partner, if, if uh, I, uh, uh, Lisa and her team, Megan, uh, if you ever need another uh, uh, set of ears to share some of your thoughts about how you'd like to use the building. We're certainly open to that. You can reach us through info at Creative Hub um, 1352, or you can also just give me a phone call uh, and uh, I can certainly pro provide that in the chat room as well. Um, I'm just gonna leave you with one thing. We have a big event coming up in, um, in uh, the end of 
of March on March 26th. And if any of you are following us on social media, you'll see um, a thing called the Lost Museum. And um, I just have a, a few images here and a little bit about it. Uh, I see that Heather Snell's on the call as well. So hopefully if people have more questions about it, she's one of the artistic di directors. Um, it's a digital platform uh, event that we're holding, uh, which has an exhibit, eight exhibits in it. Uh, over 50 artists, over 250 people have been participating in it in the community. And we launch it on um, uh, March 26th, which is a Friday evening. And it starts at 7.30 p.m. We're also um, partnered with uh, Stonehooker Brewery and they're doing a, a food and, uh, and a beer uh, tasting from 6 to 7.30. So there's a lot of things uh, leading up to it. We also have uh, art workshops um, coming out of the collections that will be hosted over the next couple of weeks. And the interesting thing about the platform is it will be ongoing after the launch. So we're hoping to add new collections to the, to the uh, platform over the months ahead and conduct more workshops. So you'll hear more about some of the other projects that um, the community can be involved in over the next year as well. So uh, in closing, thanks again very much for, uh, for inviting me and having me a part of today's discussions. And I look forward to hearing the conversations today. You bet. Did you want to share anything visually from in situ? Yeah, so uh, I'm up on the screen now and I thought maybe I could, you could see it, but um, let's see, why aren't you seeing it? Um, I think you have to allow me to, uh, you have to share the screen. We've, you've got, you've got it. Okay. Uh, and folks, what we'll do during the presentation and, and so on is we'll just go into uh, mute mode. Uh, please do keep your cameras on so we see all these beautiful faces. They're inspiring, of course. And, um, and, and while we have an opportunity to see in situ, it's, it's been uh, one of those rare occasions where you, you get to see what the North Building looks like. And I was, I was saying beforehand that... Uh, it's, it's been kind of a spooky experience going into the North Building and in situ with the, the lights down low and, and people popping out of doorways and all sorts of wild stuff going on. It's been one of the most creative events in the city. So I've loved it uh, when we've had a chance to see it. So we can come back to those images later if you like, Diane. If you well, I, I just have the one image for you today. So, so the whole idea is because we couldn't get into the building, uh, the, the Lost Museum is circling the world and uh, it, it finds its way into the building without us, but we create a portal for people to come into it. And when you enter the portal, you go in to see uh, uh, the eight exhibits, which are um, all been curated uh, with professional artists in it and emergent art artists. And there's a whole combination of, of uh, collections in there that uh, speak to spoken word, uh, lost letters, lost umbrellas, uh, lost stories, uh, a whole series of, of things and presented not only in visual arts, but performing arts as well, and spoken word and a number of uh, gaming features as well. So um, it, it, it's, it should be a real interesting um, exploration into a different kind of platform, not a, just a standard exhibit. There's a much more animated and uh, interactive uh, features in it. So I'll leave wow. it at that. Thanks again, Mike. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, Diane. And our, our next uh, speaker is a real friend to the arts in Mississauga. Many of us know uh, Lisa Abbott and have enjoyed uh, getting to know her and her contribution along with a really animated culture division. Uh, we've got Megan Press here, who's the, I think, I, I hope I got your title correct, Megan. It's the manager of the Small Arms Inspection Building, I believe. And certainly Megan is hugely helpful in making things happen in the South Building, where you've had a, a number of funky events. I know music video shoots, dances, and, and some of our micro grant winners have used the space and it's been very helpful to them. So. Um, Good for you. Uh, did I get your name right? Uh, and title right, Megan? Supervisor. It's Supervisor Small Arms Inspection Building. Lisa's the manager. So. Okay, good. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. So great talent at the Small Arms Building. We just have to make them busier. That's the thing. We want to keep them really busy. 
So anything you've got, do you want to use that building, get in touch with Megan and she'll help you out. Um, so Lisa Abbott, um, Lisa, maybe you can introduce the, the project to us and, and know that, um, you know, we're really excited and it's so promising and I know it's a huge deal to you guys. So can you uh, introduce us to it? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mike. And I'm really appreciative of everyone being on the call today, especially as you pointed out, three o'clock on a Friday. It's good turnout. I'm impressed. This is great. Um, so I do have some slides. So let me share my screen with you. If you can just give me a thumbs up. Anyone can give me a thumbs up. Can you see it? I can. Mike's talking, but he's muted. Thanks. I just wanted to mention any questions. We'd love to see them. If you've got some, you know, you just want to put them in the chat. We're surveying the chat. Uh, Sherry and Susan are on top of that. And then we'll also have a situation where you just put your hand up and we'll pick you out and you can ask Lisa a question because she's here really to help us understand the promise and answer questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike, for that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think that what we'll do is we'll go through a very short presentation and then uh, definitely if you have questions, put them in the chat and we can have a bit of an open ended conversation at the end. We can address questions in the chat or if people want to un uh, unmute, we'll do all of the questions and comments at that time. So if you can see my screen here, uh, this is the project site for the redevelopment of the Small Arms Inspection North building. Uh, for those of you, I, I'm hoping everybody on the call is a little bit familiar with the building. If not, feel free to reach out because we love talking about the history of the building. It's got such an incredible rich history. Um, as, as Diane mentioned as well, uh, such a great history also of community involvement um, and dedication to the space. Um, the city got involved, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we purchased it in 2017 and then it opened in 2018. I came on board uh, officially with the building, uh, not until 2019, in April of 2019, and Megan came on board shortly after that in the fall of 2019. Um, in 2020, uh, what we did is we sort of did a bit of a relaunch of the building um, and introduced public hours to that south end of the building to create better access for the community. Uh, so uh, just to give that model a little bit of a plug, um, before COVID hit, the space was available to anyone to, uh, to come in for um, creative activity, Tuesdays to Fridays, 10 to 6, uh, and Saturdays from 10 to 2. And what that did is it uh, left some time, uh, peak evenings and weekends, uh, for the opportunity to have exclusive rental of the space, um, while at the same time balance the need for uh, community access. Um, that model just sort of started to kick off when COVID hit and was uh, really starting to um, build steam and was doing well. Um, and we felt like we were on the right track. And uh, so that serving as a pilot and the success of that pilot uh, led to conversations around, uh, let's see what we can do in the North building. Um, so we have developed this project site uh, in order to uh, move through the project in stages. But one of the most important things about this project is community feedback. And so it's on the city's Your Say Mississauga platform uh, where it is uh, a, a great a tool for getting feedback from the community. So I can tell you that the, the site launched on January 27th. Uh, what we did to get um, very specific feedback from the Lakeview community in particular, where it's situated, uh, is we sent out a postcard, 10,000 postcards to residents of the Lakeview community, directing them to the website and to take the survey. Um, from the survey, over 350 responses were received, which is um, pretty good for a city survey, I've got to tell you. Uh, and now we've been uh, reaching out to different community organizations to have face-to-face -face virtual meetings, just like this one. I'll I'll tell you we've done over 30 so far uh, with different stakeholders and community and, uh, organizations to get a deeper dive into feedback about what people would like to see in this space. Um, what we'll be doing is we'll be compiling the data. Oh, we will we'll be compiling the data from previous studies, um, existing spaces, and future development to inform 
uh, look at what I did. I just jumped ahead in my notes. Okay, I'm gonna forget my notes <laughs> and just talk off the cuff. That usually works best. So there's lots of time still to give your input. We are um, slowly gonna be wrapping up the community engagement portion of, of, of this part of the project. Um, but at the same time, we're gonna keep this site updated as we move through the project so that you can see where we are every step of the way. And still there's a Q and A section down here to get feedback and then this um, tab here is for history and the VR tour that Mike mentioned as well. So there's a good little blurb, uh, history of the building, and then yes, you could do a, a virtual reality tour. It's it's really sad right now with COVID. Uh, we're a bit at the mercy of the province. Uh, we can only open when they say we can open for specific activities. Otherwise, we would be hosting this meeting in the building so that people could, uh, could uh, at least get a chance to have a look at the space themselves. So I'll tell you a bit about the project timeline. As I say, the community engagement process happens uh, between January and March of this year. Uh, so we're nearing the end of it, but don't think that that just means that it stops. Um, we're always interested in hearing feedback and uh, it's really important to us on this project to engage with the community and to get it right. Um, the next phase of this is, oh, the other piece that we're working on right now is the market assessment. So what the market assessment is, it's, uh, this is where <laughs> we're uh, compiling data from previous studies. We're looking at existing paces, place, space, spaces and future development to inform uh, our um, decision-making about what are gaps in the community. Um, and now, you know, of course, Lakeview has a lot of development slated between the next five to 10 years. There is the Lakeview development right next door. There, is, there are two development applications that are directly across the street from the small arms building. Um, and there's the potential, as I'm sure you're all aware, of additional um, intensification happening uh, in the Dixie Value site. All of that intensification means um, an abundance of people and looking at what we need to have to make this a complete community. Are there different things that maybe could be placed in the small arms building to help realize that dream of, of making a complete community? So that's the market assessment piece. And then we will move into developing using all of that data and uh, to do the feasibility study. And the feasibility study really gets into the nuts and bolts of, okay, what do we want to put in each of the different rooms? Do we want to change the room configurations? Do we want to knock out walls. Um, what spaces are going to require a sink? How many outlets do we need? What does the Wi-Fi look like? Uh, so right now, all it's it's a wide open blank canvas. Anything is on the table. Anything and everything is on the table. What we know for sure that will be in, in scope is the desire to keep the overall aesthetic of the building. Uh, I think that uh, we feel very strongly that, that that heritage aspect of the building needs to be protected and preserved and celebrated. Um, there will be a requirement also to meet AODA standards. That's the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. So uh, uh, along with keeping that overall aesthetic, we do have to make some accommodations to ensure that we're meeting those AODA standards. We do have to amend the south parking lot in order to provide for adequate parking for the building. So the lot that is to the east of the building right now, if you're familiar with it, is just temporary. The other things that could come out is there could be recommendations to re rehabilitate all at once, or the recommendations could be that we'll do it in stages. Uh, we will also be benchmarking other similar facilities, uh, facilities like 401 Richmond, the Cotton Factory in Hamilton, the Bach Building in, in Philadelphia, Queen Elizabeth Park Community Center in Oakville, Alton Mills in Georgetown. All of these are great examples of cultural community hubs. So I've alluded a lot to the community engagement piece. But I think I want to also uh, provide this infographic uh, uh, to get a better understanding, a guide for decision making for the city, how we make the decisions about what will go in the space, what the final what the final numbers would look like. So it's really a, um, a balance uh, between uh, three different um, 
items that are sort of in tension with each other and they really need to be well balanced in order for the building to be successful. One is balancing community input with that gap analysis. So it's understanding not just what the community wants to see there, but also what is needed in that community. And then underpinning it all is a, an element of financial sustainability because of course it does need to have an operational model that supports the building. Um, so that's a really key thing to, to, to understand. I should also note at this time that this is a very, this is really early in our stages. It's not like we're going to get to the end of, you know, this first study and we're going to have shovels in the ground. There is no funding cur currently allocated um, in the city's 10-year capital budget for the rehabilitation of the building. So what we need to do is get this piece of it really right to make sure that we've got that financial sustainability piece solid, especially now when everyone is taking such a hit with COVID. Um, I, artists are taking a hit, small organizations, everyone is struggling. Um, it, making sure that financial sustainability is, is like the foundation for the plan for the building is very important and will be key and integral to getting the building funded. And that is the building, the front of the building, and you can see the images of some of the some of the heritage images of the faces of the women who used to work in the building. So I'd love to open it up to you right now. To uh, we've got a, a a number of our project team on the call. Uh, I, Mike, thanks for shouting out to Megan Press. Uh, we also have uh, Michael Tunney, who's on the project team. I think we have Megan Papadinets. We have Robin Solomon. Um, forgive me if I'm missing anyone. We may have Arlene DaCosta on the call. So all of our team are taking notes um, as we have this conversation and this discussion to make sure that we capture all of your feedback. If there is additional feedback uh, after this, there's all kinds of ways to get hold of us. Uh, you can please use the Your Say Mississauga site. You can type in a Q&A, uh, uh, a question right on the site, or you can connect with me directly at any time. I love talking about this project, um, and I'm lisa.abbott at mississauga.ca. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that I can see the chat, and that will give me an opportunity to answer any questions that are directed right now. Mike, did you wanna sort of facilitate that, the, Q and A. Yeah. There are, yeah, I'm not seeing anything in the chat right now, but I think it'd be uh, good too if you go on uh, gallery view, so that uh, if people are waving at us, we have a better chance of of seeing them. And uh, the questions it helps us, you know, manage the questions or not ask the same ones over again. If you can take a moment and do a bullet form version of the of your question in the chat. Certainly, um, Lisa, one of the things that I've heard is, uh, you know, questions about accessibility, where someone is kind of excited about the promise of the space, but they're concerned about when they can get in. Is there, is there issues about coming in on a Sunday or in the evening? And I was mentioning to you uh, earlier that, uh, you know, we're tenants of City Hall and the way we get in on a weekend or what have you is we have a, a card, an electronic uh, entry card that we use to get into the building. And then we have the keys to our particular office. So anyway, it can be done. And I'm just curious if uh, you have thought about how you might do that, if, if there's a position on it so far. Yeah, great question. So certainly the South Building, given the fact that it is like a large open event space, um, it is, uh, it's a really different space than the front of the building. The front of the building, there's 27 different rooms <laughs> that have the potential to be rehabilitated. Obviously, the way that we're looking at this is, is uh, a broad range of activities could happen in this building. There's 24,000 square feet. There's room for everyone. Um, so I really do think that that uh, one of the proposals that we will land on is the idea that uh, th there can be set spaces that are that are leased out or licensed out to tenants who would have their own at their 24 seven access to the building. 
Um, other things like artist studios, there's definitely the possibility that, you know, a, a larger space can be created and, um, and artist studios can be there. And it can be run in a number of different ways. There's a whole lot of different operating models. There's not just one model that's going to work. And we're looking at all different ways so that we can land on what's the right magic formula for this building. Uh, it could be that there's, a, we don't know at this point uh, what that kind of is going to look like, but we've got to do the work, put in the work now, and make sure that we get that with the, uh, the, the upfront piece right, which is uh, what does the physical space have to look like in order for uh, us to understand the cost implications and then how to get it funded. Very good. If you have a question from where you're seated, then by all means, just uh, put your hand up or use the hand up function that's available uh, on the bottom of your screen under reactions to the right hand side if you want to use that. Uh, so it's, it's wonderful how open this sounds and, and uh, opportunity for people to form around a space and, and look at how that space could be designed to suit them. All of that is on the table and it's fantastic and uh, we have not had anything like it in Mississauga and uh, the opportunity for people to work together uh, never been better. So <clears throat> one of the things that, sorry, it was a question, yeah? Um, Diane is asking uh, if Lisa has the site floor plan that she, we can see the main and second floor and then mention the bridge rooms. Fabulous. So what I have is on the Your Say website, there's actually uh, the ground floor plan and the second floor plan are, uh, are on that website. So anyone can open it up. I can share the link to the site in the chat if that's helpful. Um, and then everyone can have access to those floor plans unless you wanted me to pop it up right now, but I'm not sure if that's the the I can, uh, up to you. Diane, uh, no, Lisa, got it. You've shared it to everybody. It should be good. Okay. Well, one of the things you said 27 rooms and uh, just eyeballing them, uh, you, you can sort of imagine anything from, let's say, 280 square feet to, it looks like probably a 1,500 square feet would be one room. So there's a lot of variations inside those kind of ends as guesstimates based on my own sort of tour of this. And I found it really helpful because you get a feel for where there's walls. You know, maybe walls are a key ingredient in what you're doing. Uh, and so some may have more windows than others. And uh, the other thing is you get a chance to see how thick those walls are. So the, the soundproof capacity of this space, I think is significant based on just eyeballing a foot thick concrete wall. That's, that's pretty good soundproofing. So when, when we look at this, I'm hoping that there's a place for music. We had a, a gentleman contact us and said, well, this, this will be great for a recording studio. Mike, why don't you get some money together and we'll make a recording studio. So we're, <laughs> we're interested in helping for sure. But uh, there are all sorts of options when you have this many different size spaces. And uh, there should be, and we'll happily help marry people who have an interest. Perhaps you want to meet someone who might have your interest. We'd be happy to help broker any of those kinds of engagements. But Lisa's talked to this as being a really a neat opportunity for people to form around a shared interest and then look at dividing up the use of the space or uh, you know, the cost of the space and so on. I see Andrea's here, Andrea Kovac from Crane. Hi, I'm just curious if there's a theater application for this building. Um, hi, Mike. Hi. Lisa. Hi. What is the ceiling height of the spaces? Can you speak oh, you up a bit? Sure, what is the ceiling height? Oh. I might have to defer to Megan Press on that one. I'm not sure if I can answer that off the top of my head. No worries. And it does vary depending on where you are in the building. Yeah, I, I might have to get back to you. Feet. I might have to get back to you on that, Andrea, because it's the south building is different than the bridge, which is different than the the first floor, and then there's the second floor. It, it's twenty feet throughout uh, the entire. No, just the south hall. Just the south hall. Okay, yeah. And, and then 
it, it, uh, it drops in the north uh, hall, uh, the north building because they're mostly meeting room spaces or office spaces formally. So they are higher than than nine feet, but uh, they're not twenty. Yeah. So Mike, to answer that to your question, um, that would be too low of a ceiling for a theater because the theater needs a fly house usually, or even if you're doing a black box grid. Um, even 20 feet, it's on the low, low end. Mm. Um, so if there would be a possibility to lift the roofs, um, I've been across the buildings on both north and south sides. And um, for theater space, the most appropriate room is on the second floor, the one that's facing the, la the lake. Yep. Because um, it has bigger um, rooms and it's not facing the street, so it's less noise. It's just more secluded because noise is one factor in theater, but height is really the major factor. Theater always needs a lot more space than what you see just of the stage space and the auditorium. There is also things that are around because if you want to move pieces in and out, um, but ceiling is, is really the, the key part. And due to the heritage nature of the building, I'm not sure if, if it would be possible to lift the roof or not. That's why. Sounds yeah. like that'd be a tough sell to me, uh, Lisa. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not sure if this this is helpful for your needs, Andrea, but, and it's not technically in Mississauga, but we did just meet with Humber College and found, found out that they, they're, they're developed, we found out more information about the develop, redevelopment that they're doing, uh, and they're adding a 250,000 square foot performance venue uh, with two different theater spaces. One will be a 600 soft seat theater, and the second will be a smaller recital hall. Um, certainly a beautiful addition <laughs> and not very far away, <laughs> but uh, not in Mississauga, but art should not have borders or boundaries. But having said that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, Small Arms Building is a wonderful project that can accommodate a lot of different uses. Uh, we are a Mississauga based theater, so we're going to continue to premiere all of our pieces here. And I'm sure that there is existing theaters that are um, at, at um, our use and, and disposal. So I, I wouldn't yeah. worry that that necessarily has to be part of it. I'm, I'm sure there's other ways how we can and have in the past collaborated with the Small Arms Building already. I'm the sure as well, absolutely. There are lots Sherry? of questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah so ahead. there's lots of questions. Um, Colleen said, is there an area of feedback that would be particularly useful to your team, Lisa? Accessibility, question mark, use of space, question mark, community need, question mark. So all of those things. Um, so what has been really useful is we did touch on a lot of those uh, themes uh, through the survey. Um, so we've been gathering feedback like that um, and then having uh, this conversation really like through this meeting and we've had other meetings with other organizations as well and gathering your thoughts on accessibility and use of space and community need. Very good. Sherry, got another one? Yep. Um, Laura Beaton says, as an artist, I need a space in which to meet potential customers to close a sale. I would also prefer to have a virtual studio address so that customers do not have my home address. If this space could accommodate a virtual studio, just like executive space, it could also provide additional revenue for the building. You know, that's the first time that that has been brought forward to us. So I appreciate that comment. I think that that's a great idea. We'll definitely add that to our feedback. Very good. Um, we also have, uh, oh, there's a hand raise. Uh, that's th Thinia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's question, yeah. here. Yes. So I'm an artist uh, in Mississauga and I also belong to a group called Art Trends. We are around uh, 10, 12 uh, people here. And um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the issue that we are having is some of us like to work big. And now uh, we are looking for like studio big large spaces. Uh, where we can bring in the canvases, maybe if it could be like a membership or something um, that is a three months membership when you have like a commission piece that you need to work on so you can, you know, delegate those three months for it or something like that. And, um, uh, and just a studio space if somebody wants to continue with it. So that's something we are all uh, looking into. 
So it would be great to know. And, and what a beautiful space, I must say. The light is just inspiring for us to come and paint there. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. Um, I think studio spaces are something that we have heard loud and clear. It's at, uh, you know, the top of the list in terms of um, in, in terms of the survey responses. Uh, in terms of that sort of operating model, we'll get there. We're not there yet. Um, it'll be a little bit further down the road in terms of whether, you know, it's a membership or, or how that piece of it is run. Very good. Okay, Carolyn Augustin, I've got. And Sherry, did you have another question from the chat? There's more questions, but then Heather Snell also. So let's go with Caroline first. Okay. Thank you. Um, great to see everybody. Um, I am a former board member of the uh, SAS, which a small arms society, which evolved into the 1352 Creative Hub. And there was a study done, a pretty intensive study done about uh, possible options and how to sustain it in terms of um, financially being uh, financially independent. Is, has this been taken into account or is this going to be taken into account? Because there's a lot of groundwork, I think, that has already been done, a lot of good work that has already been done and put into that document. Is this, um, a, a, how does this flow into you know the city's vision that's a great question caroline and nice to see you again i haven't seen you in a little bit yeah for sure yeah. um definitely uh that is something that is part of the project uh so all of the documents that that we have received um prior to now mm -hmm. um we are drawing from absolutely uh because you're right a lot of groundwork has been laid already and there's absolutely no reason to let all that good work go to waste and we're looking at it um and it's definitely a factor i think the thing that we're recognizing that we've had to recognize is there's been so much change since the documents were originally done mm -hmm. um, and there will be so much change in the next five to ten years that we're really trying to take all of those factors into account right. um, but a great great uh, comment for sure right uh, just one other comment is that it seems that everybody who has been through the space who has used the space they, they kind of have a sense of belonging, like it belongs to them. It belongs to the community and the community has to be able, they want to be a huge part of this, not so much like a managed property, um, like your other um, uh, community centers. It, the feedback that we've always heard is everybody wants to get involved because this building which doesn't seem so much from the outside, once you enter into it, has an amazing aura that draws you in and makes you a part of it. And that coupled with the community wanting to be so much a part of it is a very, very strong um, motivator, I think. And, and we can't let that go, that it just has to be a, a living part of the community, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, and I think the only way for the building to be successful is to uh, continue that idea that uh, it is uh, about community and community is the forefront of the uh, of the vision for moving it forward. It has to be embraced by the community. Um, so really good comments. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So I think we're going to go to Heather and then we'll probably alternate between live folk and, and chat. Oh, that means I'm alive, okay? So yes, you are. <laughs> I appreciate that on a Friday afternoon. Hi, thanks, and thanks for hosting the forum. Um, I, you know, coming from a perspective of having been involved in the in situ, so obviously I've got a, a particular um, uh, kind of interest in the space in the building, and I. I'd like to go right back, though, in terms of process, and I know that some of these, uh, Lisa, you spoke to, but I think it's really, really critical as we, you know, the tendency because the space is so interesting um, and has such potential is to jump in and start to think about, um, you know, the walls and the rooms and such. And I'm, um, I, I believe that what's really important, um, particularly now in Mississauga, is to establish the principles of practice. So what do we value? 
and and then um, that will give the vision shape. So values about community, which um, you know Carolyn just um, spoke to, accessibility, which is absolutely critical, not only in terms of space, um, but affordability, um, accessibility in terms of universal design, not just physical access, uh, the underrepresentation of voices. Um, and risk tolerance. And so what are, what are the primary values here and principles of practice that will inform the, the physical shape? And then that leads us into the operating model, which we've kind of heard about, but I think it's really critical before, um, so that the space represents the operating model and the values as opposed to the space dictating the operating models and the value. Those things have to be in sync. And how do we do that? So that we might be looking at, as Carolyn suggested, a, a, a different operating model. Um, one where, um, you know, um, it's not necessarily a capital exchange of, of uh, uh, money for, uh, for rent or lease of space. How can we work on different kinds of exchanges in operating models and direction and, and leadership and ownership? And then I think the third thing is the elements of the space. And, um, you know, Mike, you spoke to the sound and, and there was an earlier comment about the light. There are vaults in the building that have exquisite acoustics. Um, and that's, that's, they're, they're beautiful. And um, the light, the largeness of the spaces, um, and there, I think the messiness of the space as it exists now has become part of the heritage. And one of its redeeming values is that certainly with events like in situ, artists can come in and craft the space. And I would hope that some of that could be retained because um, it's very special and it's what, uh, you know, you open the door uh, when the first in situ and people just came in because they wanted a space where they could do things they couldn't do somewhere else. And that's important. And then that gives us a sense of if we're planning um, to, um, to, to meet the space and to shape the space for now, I think it's really important to have conversations about what art and art practice will look like 20, 30, 40 years from now, because it doesn't look like what it looked like 20 years ago. And there are models and we all are familiar with certain models of you know, shared studio spaces and artscape and such. Those, those, those models are 30 and 40 years old. And, and where they were innovated, the, the face of arts practice is going to be very different. And so um, flexibility and, and a way to embrace those future visions, I think are really, really critical. Um, so that we, you know, we don't end up with something that represents 2020 when by 2030 we're stale dated, right? So tall order, but um, but I think you know if we focus because I I think that there's so much potential um, that to really go back to the first principles of practice is is really the values is is really where I hope we can spend time nurturing that root. Um, before, um, you know, tackling some of the detail. Thank you. Thank you. Lots to unpack there. Um, I was frantically writing. <laughs> um, so if just to address like one or two things, um, I think certainly COVID has shown us that uh, things can change dramatically very, very quickly. Uh, and so your points are very well taken. Um, also your points about values, uh, also something that's, uh, that is important. And we are, uh, we are looking at for sure um, in terms of uh, staying true to our commitment through the culture master plan to support arts and in Mississauga. Uh, so yes, lots to unpack there. And I did write notes frantically and happy to have further conversations with you, Heather, about it and love to, as always, love to hear your input. Okay, so there's a lot more questions in the chat. Sherry, you wanna, yeah. Yep, um, so let's start with uh, Jasmine. Uh, uh, said Lisa on the timeline when would this be building be ready for occupancy if artists are willing to move in as soon as the basic space is ready 
That is such a great question. I'm glad you asked it, Jasmine. So it's not a great answer. <laughs> so uh, developing the vision for the building and understanding the, the costing is one piece of it. Um, then we need to undergo the hurdle of, uh, of, of the funding piece of it. Uh, at, as I mentioned before, we don't have funding in place for it. Uh, so we have to get a plan together that is really exciting that we're going to get people excited about that we're going to get you know council excited and they're going to endorse it and we're also going to get other potential funding partners other levels of government potentially excited about it uh, once that happens uh, then you will get into construction so uh, if if uh, all is good and all of the stars align beautifully uh, we would submit for a capital budget request for the 2023 budget cycle um, there's no saying for sure that that is going to go through. Uh, we're undergoing, of course, a time right now of, of tremendous financial austerity measures. Uh, so we are just going to keep our fingers crossed and keep hoping that the stars align. So I can't give you a timeline on when the building would be ready. It just wouldn't be realistic of me to do so right now. But the hope is that we have a plan uh, that is shovel ready. And I use that word, that, 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 that term intentionally. Uh, in the past, the federal government has asked for projects that uh, were shovel ready um, because they're prepared to come in with uh, infrastructure funding on a portion of them. And uh, for those of you who remember the ISF uh, program from uh, the city benefited greatly from it in and around uh, to 2010, 2011. And it's how we got our celebration square among uh, redevelopments of four libraries and a multitude of other um, pools and recreation centers in the city. So uh, the plan is to make sure that we're ready if something like that is announced again. Mm -hmm. Exciting. And the more people, the more conviction, the more commitment from residents, the more powerful Lisa's case will be. And the, the balance of those three uh, sort of metrics that we're going to be used on this project, uh, the more robust the community engagement side is, it's going to help on a number of things that I know people are very interested in around tangible elements like costs, uh, accessibility, and so on. Uh, we got any more live folk questions before we go back to the chat? Okay. I think Noel was first, but uh, Rubina, you're you're close second. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to, um, well, thank you for, for having this, um, uh, this forum. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Um, and I'm just seeing a couple of things in the chat that are all kind of, all variations of kind of the same thing. And I think a lot of people are, are kind of like, let's just open the, open the doors to the community and let the artists in. Um, and I know I threw a, a question up there. Have you actually ever considered letting the community be involved in the actual building process? And I know there's a lot of technical things and, and all of that kind of thing, but, um, uh, and, and as a, as a uh, my, my father's an architect and I understand that we need to live with the spaces to know what they want to, what they say to us and what we need. Um, we need to, to be in this space. And I know from doing the last two in situs, we got to know the space. It told us what it wanted to be. All the artists who walk through the space know what it wants to be. We all have ideas of, uh, you know, easels set up in the sun and, and dance performances in the big dance space. What, what would it look like if the community were actually to be involved in say the building process? And in that process, we actually engage in actual place making. We don't just talk about it, we actually do it. And we actually can get to know our neighbors and get to know the other artists who want to use the space and go, oh, hey, you paint doors, I paint doors, have you ever seen this? We can actually start a genuine conversation. And I think, especially right now with COVID, we're, we're just so used to seeing people on a screen and the conversations are kind of stilted. If we actually use the space as a place making space as a way of building community and together as an organization, we discover what the space wants to be. And then we can say, oh, okay, all the artists, all the, all the painters are congregating over here. This seems to want to be a paint studio. And the vaults have the most amazing, amazing uh, sounds. 
why not turn that into the audio space? And we get to live with the space and understand what it is that it actually wants to be. Um, exactly like our old fashioned barn raising or bringing a community together to build a quilt. It, we can't do it by ourselves. It can't just be one person. It takes an entire community to build and stitch an entire quilt, right? So um, basically if you open the doors right now, you'd have a lineup down the street. I think pretty much everybody on this chat would be like, let us in. Um, and it would also address some of the funding issues because the artists can then create the programming um, and, and basically help with some of the fundraising. It, I know some of the spaces aren't, um, you can't really go into them because like the fire exits have been knocked down. But if you do basic minimal repair, the rest of it will come and the rest of it will tell, uh, tell us what it wants to be. We have to listen to the space basically. Anyway, great. I'm ranting. Great. Well said. <laughs> no, great comments, Noelle. Really wonderful, wonderful, heart, heartfelt. Um, I, I can tell you the North Building is not zoned for occupancy, um, and it's more than just the the, the fire exits. Um, I will, I, I mean, in a perfect world, it would have been great to have been able to um, to have like these sessions in the north building just for the purpose of of uh, of some of the things that you're saying and COVID is unfortunately like uh, we don't have control right now over over it the provincial regulations um really are are what are dictating um the 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 ability to um allow access to the space at the moment as is the case with uh, with all of our facilities um but your points are well taken and uh I, i'll take that feedback back for sure thank you one of the things that's been mentioned is messiness. We've heard that note a couple times. And, and what was mentioned to me by a visual artist is just being able to relax that if she could actually spill paint on the floor and it wouldn't be something she was apologizing for for the next few months, you know, just sort of can move on, be creative, make it live. And, and don't we find that those kinds of creative messes are so appealing? And we see when artists are brought into buildings uh, all around the world, they add value to that which is around them. They are creating points of interest that really you know, accelerate the um, sort of profitable development of spaces around them. So it's, it's a really neat relationship between uh, creatives and real estate values. Uh, question, how about it, Sherry? We got something in chat land? Yeah, so Arizu Studio says, hello, I have a question regarding cost accessibility. Will all the studios be for rent or are there plans to have a merit-based juried, free of charge or funded artists in residence program for those in the community who need but cannot afford studios? Yeah, great question. Um, I personally think, yes, there should be for sure. Um, but we're getting into, it's, uh, it's sort of a, another step ahead in the process. So I think that that's absolutely on the table. Um, I, I, it, I don't know who necessarily would be running it. It might not be the city running that. It could be another organization running that piece of it. Um, there's a lot of different ways that that could come about. I think that that makes total sense. And, um, you know, it, it, there's a, we've heard it a lot. Uh, so I think that there's a very good chance that it will go in the plan. Um, it, it's very early in the, in the process right now for, for us to say uh, one way or the other, though. But your comments are heard. Very good. Thank you. Uh, anyone else would like to be heard? This is great. And looks like we've got another of the amazing Snell family raising your hands. So, Colleen, it's your turn. Hi there. Um, thank you for, for hosting and for having this meeting. Um, so I'm a, my name is Colleen and I'm the artistic director of a, a group called Frog in Hand. And I'm also an independent dancer. And I just, I, um, I feel very raw in this conversation. There are lots of emotions. Um, and I think I want to speak from the dance community um, and say, we've recently lost dance makers, dance makers, uh, amazing heritage building, amazing place for dance. I became an, I decided to become a dancer there when I was an adolescent 
We lost Hub 14, which was a community space for the arts. And we lost Dover Courthouse recently is closing. That's three floors of, of creative force where Cage of Dance and Princess uh, Creations, all of these incredible companies. Um, and the loss that I feel when I share that with you is not for the loss of space. It's not just about the place. I'm hurting because my friends don't have a house. They don't have a home. I can't run into them in the hall anymore. The places where we shared laughter and were able to grow together and challenge each other um, will not come back. They're gone now. So what this means is it's not just lock and key rental that's needed. It's a sense of purpose and to be able to rise up out of this loss means, you know, collaboration that combats isolation. It combats this feeling of loss. So I'm interested not just as a grassroots organization being not only engaged, but being a co-author in the story of our future. I don't simply want to engage in the process. I wanna to help to build something with people. And so renting a space I think is helpful, but I've seen in the past, there are sometimes unintended consequences like gentrification that do arise. Um, and I think it's really important for us to consider those consequences because there's, there's certain importance to feeding the roots and not the crown, right? To moving forward together. So I would just support the things that folks have been saying in the chat and, and say, I think what we need is not only space, but, uh, but place, but, but ways of being together. And I think that means it's, it's not simply a question of, you know, where can I put my easel or how do I plug into the sound system and, and individual little cubicles because we need connection. We, we need to be face to face. We, we need to find ways of actually, you know, um, sharing a cup of tea one day because we both happen to be at the studio until midnight. That's what's lost. That's what's so hard to find. And it's, it's that relationship. It's that sense of identity. It's the purpose of why we do what we do. It's, I, I don't make dances just, you know, I mean, it's very fun, but not just for my own pleasure. It's to connect with people and to feel like, you know, if I weren't there or if you weren't there, it would be felt, it would be a, 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 a difference, right? So I just wanted to put forward that I think rentals are really helpful. They're really important, but um, just looking at dance makers and Hub 14 and Dover Court, um, I think there's more. I, th I think that there's more that's possible here. That as well, but this is why I was excited when someone mentioned a, some kind of residency or collaborative opportunities, because the, the thing that we've lost is, is greater than space, which means that in order to fill that void, we need to build back more than just a lock and key kind of building, right? So forgive the rawness. <laughs> that's Not at all. I'm... Thank you so much, Colleen. Yes, absolutely. I, 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 I hear what you're saying and, and your comments are well noted um, and, uh, and they echo uh, many of the things that we have heard already. And, uh, you know, I, I, I personally, yes, 100%. I feel like that's that's absolutely what the building needs. And I think that there's lots of ways that that, that is going to happen. Um, just appreciate the honesty um, and the ability um, to articulate uh, something that I, I can see that you're so passionate um, and it's so meaningful to you. So I, I really want to thank you for that. If I could follow up on Colleen's remarks and just ask you, Colleen, you, you said you don't do this for yourself. You know, you do it as a means of connecting with others. And I think, you know, in the political realm, certainly the number of people you reach is hugely significant. And I just wonder if you could elaborate on, you know, this creating a sense of community. It's, it's more than the artists themselves. I think you're talking about it's it's about the public coming in and engaging with you in a variety of, of mutually inspiring and uh, sustaining ways. Could you, is that part of what you're referring to? 
I mean, when, when I've worked with um, in situ and creative hub and in all of these amazing ways we've been in the building, one of the things that's been so incredible has been to work in a multidisciplinary intergenerational way where it it's artists and quote unquote non artists, but folks who have a stake in the building all coming together for a shared purpose. And so I think when I when I consider the um, when I consider the space and and what I've seen there, it's about repeatedly interacting with people and getting to know their stories, and um, building community by by sharing community and getting to know people really. So I think I think there's a lot there in terms of the the idea of creating opportunities for people to. Um, bump into each other. It's like, do you remember, Megan, when there was the um, the little coffee place that was in the small arms building in the back and it was there for about a month. I know this because I was probably like the person who bought the most coffees ever. I was there every day, but it was an amazing place just standing in line where you could chat, oh, what are you doing in the building today? Or did you know that this person, you know, have you seen the exhibit or did you listen to the, you know, the, the sound installation on the roof? Just standing in line, those organic connections that are made, because that's what I'm talking about in terms of not being hermetically sealed in your own tiny little studio. Sometimes we need that, but we also need to be able to chat while having a coffee in, in organic places where there's flow and ability to exchange. Also that coffee was really, really good. Oh, Arch it's Top Cafe. Top. Yeah, That's right. absolutely. We asked them to come and do a pop-up. <laughs> So yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. And I think that we uh, have heard that feedback um, and it, it, it's coming shining through. So uh, yeah, definitely an important part of the plan are those community spaces for people to bump into each other and for collaboration to happen and those sparks to fly. And that's often when I used to work in theater and uh, we used to say that theater didn't necessarily happen on stage. It happened after the show when you ran into somebody and, and it was like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. Here's my great idea. I've been meaning to reach out to you. And so that's the, you kind of have to build that in for sure. Lisa, Certainly Alton Mill has a lovely coffee shop. Sorry, Megan, go ahead. I was just going to add that that's also, you know, that's a big part of why we started, why we launched the public hours model at the beginning of January, just to sort of, it's the reason why we're cultural workers. We like those happenstance situations where, you know, every day is a little bit different or the same person, one person, you know, comes in for the first time and then they come back every week. Um, it's those conversations and following other people's stories. At least that's what makes me happy to work in a space like a cultural hub. So thanks for sharing that. Okay, Sherry, have we got anything else on uh, on chat before? I think Carolyn wants to add something. Yeah, um, Amy asked, as a newer participant in this conversation, can I ask about the context for the context for the different names: Small Arms Society, Small Arms Building, Save, and Creative Hub thirteen fifty two. Diane? Yeah, so yeah. maybe Diane and I might both want to want to chime in. So um, the Small Arms Inspection Building is the the official name of the building as per the heritage designation that was done in 2009. And before we relaunched the building, we rebranded it as um, the Small Arms Inspection Building and SAIB for short. Yeah, and just further to Lisa's comment, um, Historically, the building was referred to building number 12 <laughs> uh, and uh, did, really had a no name and was part of the small arms limited plant. So this is the last building on the site where there were, uh, I believe, I think 13 other buildings. And this was just used for inspection. But more uh, as a non-profit uh, group in and uh, the city. Did so, everyone hear uh, what Diane just said? No, okay. 
Diane, we lost probably most of what you just finished saying for some reason, just electronic something. Okay, all right. Uh, can you hear me now? Mike, maybe you could just let me know if you hear me. Yep. Hello. Okay. I can hear you. Uh, so the the. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, so um, the the Small Arms Society used to be uh, the our our older name, and we moved to Creative Hub thirteen fifty two to reflect more about what we were doing in the building in terms of making it a creative space. Uh, and Small Arms Society has been slowly dropped off. Uh, it was used historically, but uh, uh, people don't always re uh, uh, relate to the name very well, Small Arms Society, thinking that we're in the armament those businesses, as you can appreciate. So we've, we've dropped that and we've moved to that. But we're, um, we're uh, you know, we consider ourselves a partner with the city, uh, not in the official document sense, but we, uh, we collaborate where we can as, as a user of the space. And we uh, strongly advocate for a, a strong community model in terms of how the building uh, gets used and how it's programmed and how people are engaged in it. So we always push towards that. And I think the city shares that vision as well. And, uh, you know, we, we are a, 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 could be, you know, a tenant and a user, a renter of the space, if you look at it in the simple terms. So we try to add because I, I the city's always encouraged us to make sure that, uh, you know, it's got to prove itself from a programming. And in the early stages, it was like, well, you know, will this space get readily used? And I think the city's been able to show that it can in the South End uh, with, with our involvement and a whole bunch of other uh, great partners and people interested in the space. So our job is to continue to push those sorts of things. So we've developed, you know, the Lakeview um, Farmers Market on Sundays, again, to draw attention to the space and, and the site. And uh, we hope to offer a beer festival this year. And we have some other plans for some other event related things, but it's more than just events. And um, we have some heritage projects and things underway as well, as well as inter environmental. But the whole idea is using those as a catalyst to, to engage people and get people participating and taking ownership to the space and feeling like they're part of the community. And um, it, philosophically, we're very entrenched with that model. And uh, it's very much a community development model and approach that we like to use um, in how we, we use the space and hopefully work with the community wherever we can. Okay, fulsome answer. Uh, Caroline, did you have something? And Rabina, I think you had something earlier. I don't know if, you've, if it's been answered since uh, we looked your way or not. Just so just let us know, Carolyn's up now. Thank you. Um, it's actually, Lisa, thank you so much. I have to thank you for being a visible champion for the energy and the movement and the arts, because we know that you do represent the city. We know that there are machinations, you know, that we have to go through reports that we have to put forward, you know, engineering, uh, uh, architecture, safety, and all the hundred and, and 1000 things that have to go in before you even think about funding, you know, getting funding from the city. So many um, um, tick box that you have to check off before you can actually get that. So you really are our navigator to how we can get this best approved through the city channel, because I think you've seen the desire of everyone here to commit and you've got an army of volunteers with so much talent. And it makes me think back to the process when you say, oh my God, 10 years before we can get the funding. Uh, that's a very scary thought. And in a previous life of mine, when I was working with a design manufacturing company, they introduced a process called um, concurrent engineering. And if anybody's, if you're familiar with that, fantastic. So usually from design to actual manufacture to in the stores, 
it could take about two to three years because you know somebody would design it, it would go to engineering, engineering would say, you can't make this, please redesign this. And then it goes to manufacturing, manufacturing says, who, who engineered or designed this because this can't be done. So it's a linear process, but with concurrent engineering, we have in our army, our arsenal, we have architects who are keen supporters. We have builders who are keen supporters. We have interior designers, visionaries, you know, uh, programmers. And coming back to what Noel said, there are so many, we can build this. Uh, we, we, we need you, if we, it's almost if we could form that, that team of concurrent engineering that can visualize what the end project is and cut away the layers of the linear process by doing so. Would a team be helpful to your process? It's a good question, Caroline. Um, can I take that back and, and think about it and have some conversations? For sure. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. One of the things that Caroline's talked to, and I think Colleen was referring to, and has been round in circles, is where's the, the community volunteer component might come in. Mm -hmm. And so is a structure for this, the, the co-op structure, where responsibilities are itemized and attributed and scheduled and people fulfill those? Uh, have you looked at a, like a co-op structure for this proposition? Mike, yeah, now you, again, you're getting into like the operating model. So it's something that will be flushed out and we'll, we'll um, present a, a, a few different, we'll explore a different few operating models and that co-op model is definitely on the table. Um, and, and then we'll see, you know, what we can get the most support for and what makes the most sense um, and then move forward with what makes sense for the building and the community. And we're trying to make it to be a very transparent process. So the, you know, the results of, from every stage we will share with you. Terrific, can't ask for more than that. Till oh, Mike, I, I could make a, just a comment on that. So if somebody referred to, I think Carolina document that we had created, there's been a couple of them that the Creative Hub has presented to the, the city, but we've always looked at a model that, um, that it can be made up of, of collectives and collaborative uh, industries or sectors that uh, deliver it in a different way, maybe not necessarily by, by the city or maybe in partnership with the city or looking at other models. So I think, you know, just to support what Lisa is saying, I, I know they're going to look at that later on in the process, but uh, there has been some work done on it and they've identified like some of the other buildings uh, already that are out there that they're reviewing. So they all have different operating models. So hopefully, um, you know, that'll be a discussion that I hopefully said that you'll be able to bring back to the group later on when, when, uh, when you get to that stage of the, of the study. Yes, I do too. Any more questions? Anyone? I think we're getting some more through right now, but if we want to go to a live question, feel free. Oh, go ahead, Sherry. Um, Here's um, one that I said, saw. What about using the building as, oh. As is, yeah, go ahead. Um, Colleen says, what about using the building as is in its raw state and throughout its evolution? So momentum continues to build. Yeah, as I mentioned, it's not zoned for occupancy. So it's not an easy thing to say yes to. Um, you know, there's uh, provincial building code regulations that are in place that don't allow us to open that north building to the product for uh, to the public for a variety of reasons. Um, having said that, I, I mean, if it weren't for COVID, I mean, there's opportunities to to visit and tour that space. Um, but it's, it's, it's not open to the public. However, I mean, I can certainly take that conversation back again, um, and I have, I, I, we have had it in the past, um, but I will, but we will note it as, as, as that there is strong support for that. One of the hopes that we had was that by 
um, running our community access model through the South building that we could start to build that community or that sense of purpose and use um, to sort of get momentum um, because that is the space that we do have access to. And so hopefully when our building reopens, um, we'll be inviting and hopefully we'll see a lot more of you in the space um, and we can start to have those interactions um, so that uh, there is a, a body that's ready uh, when it comes time. Great, thank you. I just wanna pick up on one question from the chat and then we'll turn to Colleen again. The uh, question is about financial transparency of the small arms inspection building. I assume it's like any other city, city you know, facility. It's a, about as transparent as it gets. Uh, Lisa, could you wanna just talk to that? Sure, Mike, thanks. Um, yes, as you say, it is a city facility. Um, so the, uh, the, the budget for it goes into the city's budget. Um, it, that, that budget and, and business planning process uh, is pretty transparent. You can, you, can see, um, you can see it on the city's website. Uh, it gets broken down into probably culture. I'm, I, I'd have to, I'm sorry, I have to double check about how granular it does get, um, but it, it's not anything that, that we would have um, you know, uh, we wouldn't be able to do anything different <laughs> about that. It, it does get rolled up into the city's budget because it is a city facility. You know, if you're getting a lot of great community feedback through this process, you've got a number of people responding to you, enabling that community to have an ongoing role in the building, which is maybe part of this question as well, is the ongoing ability to have something to say about it or have those ideas captured and utilized as the building evolves. Uh, that's where it gets different, this building from a community center or a, an arena. You don't have a community group sitting, commenting on the uses of and the potential for those kinds of buildings for whatever reason. Would there be a potential place for that in management of this site? Well, yes and no, Mike. Um, for example, we do have a Friends of the Museums organization that works very closely with our Museums of Mississauga, and they absolutely comment on our programming, and they support us in many different ways, and they're a fantastic, strong organization. Um, other groups include the Meadowvale Theatre Advisory Board, so that's a community group that works with the staff at the Meadowvale Theatre and outlines some of those uh, things that, that you've just mentioned. Celebration Square, when it first opened, also had an advisory board um, that since has evolved into a different type of board that uh, now deals with their transparency over accessibility of space. So uh, if you're, you're not aware what that process is, if you do want to um, um, present an, uh, a, um, an event at Celebration Square, you have to fill out an application form and it's reviewed by a, a panel, an advisory panel of independent citizens uh, who are not city staff. Um, and in that way, we ensure that we um, have uh, transparency and equal access to space. So I'm not saying that it's off the table. <laughs> it's the, the, right now, everything is on the table. Great. Uh, did that cover the question from Linda? Okay, anyone can else? We, can we hear from Rabina? She's been waiting for quite a while. True, true. Thank you. Go ahead, Rabina. You're, you're muted, so I'll, I'll try unmuting you. There you go. There you go. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for this forum. And um, most of my questions have been answered, but what I'm feeling today is real excitement because look at the questions and the suggestions. So there is a lot of people that are for the art community. So I'm just wondering in your planning, would you have any of the Mississauga artists on the panel? or on the advisory committee or anything or with the development uh, space? 
Uh, it's something that we can take into consideration for sure. Um, I, right now, our, our, uh, we work very closely with Creative Hub 1352, and okay. I understand that, and I know that they work with a lot of artists in the community as well. So perhaps it's something that we can channel through Creative Hub as as our as one of our um, strong partners at the table. Yes, yeah. because at UTM when we were redesigning the labs, I'm. I worked at uh, UFT. At UTM, we did have the input of the lab assistants and the lab people that were running the labs so they could design them right. to you know, the kind that they would really be using. So if different artists from different uh, you know, aspects like dancers or uh, visual arts, so if you have some people on the panel uh, they could give you some ideas of the space. Mm -hmm. That's a great comment, Rubina. And the other thing that it reminded me of is uh, a good point to clarify is we're doing, um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, it's very, we're in the very preliminary stages so that we can understand costing and then move to the funding stage. Yeah. And then we move to the design stage. So the design stage is still a few steps down the road. Uh, yeah. So, you know, absolutely. We'll take, uh, we'll take that uh, comment back um, to, yeah. to see if it can inform that design stage as well. Because there is so many people I'm really very excited to hear from different people and thanks to Lisa Mike for you know taking such an active part in the Mississauga art community it's really great to hear thank you you're doing a great job thank you very good to see you again thank you you know in a while hasn't it my my yeah well Rabina well, puts on really quite a spread if you get invited to Rabina's place just don't worry about dinner you know, you're, you're covered. Yeah. Yeah, you're Very always good. welcome, Mike. Yes, pleasure. Uh, okay, anyone else? Colleen, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah. I don't want to take up too much time. I just wanted to briefly respond to, um, I think when this is back a little ways now, but um, Lisa was saying the building is not zoned, the, the back half that hasn't been Oh my gosh, I get north and south mixed up. I apologize. The the part that hasn't been renovated is the 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 raw area. It's not it's the north, yeah, the north side. Um <clears throat> so all I would say is that the best thing you can do is tell an artist what they're not able to do because restrictions generate creative response and opportunity and knowing a limitation is actually very helpful. So it means that you know, as soon as you said that, I went, great, let's live stream, let's get a film crew in there, let's use the outside of the building, let's draw on the windows, let's, you know, put up a collage, let's make things happen on the roof, like, like the art, there's still so much that can be done. And I think what my fear is, is that the building will be left, um, will be left, not left empty, it can be empty and still have things happen around the outside on the grounds or have things happen while the space transitions to whatever it's going to become, just so that people can still continue to be involved as this transition happens. Because as we've heard over and over, people love the rawness of that space and, and that, that continuing participation is something that has just so much wonderful creative potential, even if there are restrictions because restrictions are great. Um, they, they, they help us to narrow down what we can and cannot do. So you I would that. just offer that. Very good. Sunny days. Very good, any more questions? This has been a great session. I'm delighted people could make it here today. I see Lynn Mack there amongst her, her birds, pets, certainly great sources of color. Lynn, have you got any thoughts about uh, from the fabric arts point of view? Am I on? Oh, you bet. Okay. Um, everybody's had great ideas, and um, I think to some degree, and I don't want to be a, a downer on this, but we've had said a lot of this before. And how long has the building been sort of, I don't know, four or five years has it been around? And um, I can't say 
we have we have made progress definitely, especially when um, uh, Heather Snow organised in situ. But why aren't we allowed still allowed not allowed to use it? I don't understand. So obviously, I, you're referring to the north side. The south right. side is very. Uh, I guess very I'm much confused. What use. what is north and what is south? Closest well, to Lake Shore is north, the big two-story building. Okay, so what is south then? That's, uh, well, gosh, Megan, sure. you should describe what's south. Sure, is. no problem. So when you go into the building um, from the parking lot, um, the north side of the building is, is through a set of double doors. But if you make a left, the, you're opened up into that 18,000 square feet of open space. And that's where the kitchenette is. Okay, I just thought it was all one building. Uh, it is one building, but we've partitioned it off in terms of having doors that go to the north building because only the south was rehabilitated at the time. Oh, um, okay. But the south building, once COVID is, is once we are allowed to open our doors after after COVID, um, we are we are trying to keep our doors open as much as we possibly can. I um, mean, we started with a pilot so that we would be open Tuesdays to Fridays, ten to six, and Saturdays, ten to two. We recognize that that's not enough hours, and that we want to have it open later in the daytime, and we'll get there. Um, but Unfortunately, like we're not there yet and COVID sort of hit us right when we were out of the gate. But the intention is to is to keep that public hours model and 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 make sure that the community has as much access as they possibly can to get into at least the south space, which is a beautiful space. I'm not knocking the south mm -hmm. space. Um, and we have had people who come and use it regularly for, you know, they, they've come and set up their, their easels and their, and uh, they've come and they've done uh, meetings and workshops and, and, you know, planning for events. It's open, free of charge. We want people to be there. Um, so, you know, the more people that use it, the better it, it speaks to the success of that community access model. So, uh, you know, as I say, because of COVID, we, we are not allowed to be open right now. Um, but as soon as we are, um, we will go back to, we will slowly go back to what those hours were, and then we will try to open up even further, um, as much as we can. That's the goal. Okay. So when I've driven past. Pre-COVID, I've driven past a few times and I thought, oh, can I go in? Should I go in? You know, will I get in? And I just keep going because I don't know. You should come in because we are open and we do have the we do have our sign out on on the front of the of the building that gives our our hours pre-COVID. So that was a great question. Thank you, because it was great to clarify that. I don't want anybody to think that we're not open, that that part of the building, once we are out of this um, emergency, uh, is will be open to the public again. Okay, thank you. I see the question in the chat about volunteer opportunities. I would love to address that too. So there are volunteer opportunities, absolutely. Um, we had posted for volunteers uh, shortly before COVID. And I know that Diane is always looking for volunteers through Creative Hub 1352 to work on programming. Um, so I think that there's lots of volunteer uh, positions that uh, will be coming up once we get back to something that resembles normalcy. Nice. We have a question from Aditi. Hi, Lisa. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to see you. I hope everyone's going to get ready for a nice weekend that's coming up. Um, just a quick question about uh, hearing, just hearing the back and forth. I was wondering what the process would look like to kind of remove some of those uh, zoning restrictions or addressing those zoning restrictions. Um, if they're like what that would look like only because I, I just heard that that was uh, in the back and forth. Sure. So I, I, I'm not an expert on the building code, I have to say. Um, I, I can get back to you on the specifics about uh, all of the items. It's a quite a lengthy list uh, of things that need to happen in that north building for it to be zoned for occupancy. Uh, and it's there are regulations that are set out by the province for any building that's open to the public. Thank you jump in a little it was kind of flying around the chat section um and 
again, this isn't necessarily a question, but just something for you to take away from this too, is people were wondering if it's the cost of, and it sounds like, you know, getting the building up to code, it's more than just cost. It's a lot of, a lot involved. And uh, Andrea had mentioned like, maybe there's a way we could do sort of a community city matching program if the funding is an issue or, you know, just things like that, that I think there would be community support if that is a process that might be possible. Yeah, I think that when it comes to uh, the funding piece of it, I think that there's a lot of different ways that we can approach that and, and strategize the funding. I, I, I believe that Creative Hub 1352 will be developing like a capital, uh, a capital fundraising uh, plan as well. Diane may speak to that uh, as well. Um, but certainly there's many ways to approach that. Diane, did you wanna to talk to that? Yeah, I'm just trying to un unmute myself there. Uh, yeah, just to reconfirm, uh, we're hoping that um, once uh, the city's completed their study and there's an opportunity for capital build, we'll certainly be talking with them about uh, a program and reaching out to yourselves and the wider community and how we can raise the funds to help support the project. So uh, definitely, and um, we were fortunate at enough to get some uh, Ontario Trillium funding this year to help us with a few studies, one being a, a fundraising strategy. So we'll, we'll be in close con conversation with the city on that and the community at some point in the future. It really depends on when that comes on stream. It sounds as though a bit of a checklist would be kind of an intriguing way to build interest around what the community might be able to contribute to. If there's a list of 20 items, some of them are going to be very, quite sophisticated and, and some are going to be more labor intensive or maybe even open to an innovative suggestion for a solution. I'm just curious if uh, sort of the conversation that we see in the chat and has been alluded to with folks is you know, some point of entry for the volunteers that uh, Diane might solicit to do something to contribute to the placemaking that is manageable. You know, you don't have to have a, you know, an engineering degree to accomplish. And, you know, the building's there. Uh, you know, I, I know there's going to be a, a list, but I just wonder if there's a way to create momentum, develop community around a bit of a short list where, where the, the tasks themselves are, you know, potentially manageable by, a group or army of volunteers. Yeah, my okay. I'm just curious. yeah, I'm not well, I'm not sure exactly what what it is that you're inferring. Like are you thinking about uh, you know, a group to provide support to the whole initiative or are you talking about volunteers or people who want to be engaged in things that are happening there? There's I'm talking about barn raising. I'm talking about people doing something tangible for the benefit of the building that they are capable of doing. And I think we've had a number of people talk about this. Uh, Adithi just finished talking about it. So, you know, around the group, there is um, sort of a sweat equity component, you know, lying fallow here that could be activated if they had a to-do list that was manageable and people could organize around and, and attract participation to support. I, I don't know what the task might be, but, um, and it might be that, you know, from a liability insurance, that's a silly idea, but it is taking advantage of and building community in a physical, let's get it done way that uh, I, I think we're talking about uh, amongst some of the voices here. So whether that goes to Lisa and to you, Diane, I don't know. But well, there's latent I, human resources here. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'd be more than willing and maybe, uh, Mike, you've expressed an interest to, to sort of uh, continue to build the momentum and identify what opportunities are. So maybe that's another conversation that could be facilitated to sort of explore that a bit more and where the contributions could be made or how. It's, uh, you know, that's where yeah. I want you to take it. Uh, so another session, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, the people who are on this right now, would you like to have another session? I'm not sure we can price Lisa and her superstar team 
out of their work. But uh, would this group like to get together again with Diane maybe giving us some notes and Lisa, if she'd like, we'd love to have her doing this again. Just sort of wave or, or cover your eyes. So, you know, take it negative, positive. So it looks like there's a few. And uh, one of them who just waved at me and we haven't heard from is Marie Payne. And Marie, of course, when we look at a building like this and some of the terrific spaces in it, my, my, what a terrific gallery space there could be. Uh, is this of interest to uh, Arts and the Credit? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Can you hear me? Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there just is nothing now. There's nothing in Mississauga as far as showcasing the work of the artists locally. There's nothing available to them except the events that happen, but not a permanent uh, physical space. And that would enable the public to, to come to something. I, I keep coming back to this because I think it's, it's crucial in the math that there be, uh, like in situ does, it brings a whole slew of people from you know, different parts of the city, from the community itself, but it, it points to a public benefit to residents of the city. And building in some kind of public component in you know, in your studio lives or, or your exhibition situations, uh, I think just adds strength, doesn't it, Lisa? Doesn't that make this a more uh, appealing proposition for the city to invest in? Sorry, Mike, are we talking about uh, a, a consultation session or are we talking about exhibition space? You are muted. Off mute. My dear. There Exhibitions, open houses, that Yeah, 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 for thing. sure. Yeah. yeah, so we uh, we did uh, we did launch a program uh, to uh, be able to have the community access our exhibition walls. Um, uh, so we do have that we do have the exhibition walls that are available um, at a more reasonable way. Originally, when the building was launched, we only had like one rate if you wanted to have exclusive rental. Um, so now we have the community access model where uh, the communities are allowed to come in, <laughs> but uh, by all means and and work and play and do all kinds of things in the daytime. Um, and then there's also uh, the exhibition walls uh, that are available for a, a nominal fee on, on a weekly basis. Um, so as a as a bit of a start, um, we have also heard that exhibition space is needed in the north building as well, uh, and so that's something for sure that uh, that is being taken into consideration in the plans. And in terms of like another meeting, we were I, I just thinking about what is the next uh, good stage. Um, perhaps it's when we can bring back to you something to comment on, um, or you know, I'm I, I'm not sure if there are other suggestions about what that would look like. Well, that's a good starting position. That's for sure. I think uh, there's a lot of people here, and we've spent some time on this, and it'd be great to have the story move forward to uh, another chapter, as well for folks to please take advantage of the survey. That it's not uh, a heavy survey. Some are, this isn't. And so I'd really encourage you to put your thoughts down, your, your queries, your, your hopes, um, and some of the articulate notes that you've expressed here verbally and in chat. Let's make sure those are captured in the survey because again, uh, my experience is numbers count. The number of responses counts. The number of people who contact Lisa after this meeting are gonna be counted and they'll count. So your participation uh, in an ongoing way and in, in terms of looking at, this, at the uh, virtual reality tour, uh, responding with uh, surveys, uh, participating in meetings, it all matters. It's all tracked and it all matters. So um, good for you for making this such a robust meeting here today. And uh, we'll liaise with uh, Diane and, and uh, Lisa. We'll look for a time that makes the most sense and we will publish uh, another meeting and we'll have an agenda that is 
current to that point in the process. And in the meantime, we'll hope that if you want to volunteer, you'll be in touch with Diane at Creative 1352. Uh, I'm not sure if Lisa was looking for volunteers. Yes? Not at the moment. Due okay. to COVID, we're not able to take on volunteers. Okay. So in the volunteer bullpen, uh, certainly it sounds like Diane's a good resource. And uh, frankly, learning more about what Creative 1352 has done, is doing, wants to do, that's also a great use of your time investing in the culture of this property. And uh, Megan is very reachable and you can talk to her about how best to use a South building or ideas on it, what others have done. Um, this is a phenomenal resource. And the more it's used, the sooner it's used, the more different ways it's used, the more robust the case will be. So I just wanna say thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to Lisa and her team for being such wonderful participants, supporters, listeners. And Diane, thank you very much for your leadership on this with your team at uh, Creative 1352 and the other members of the arts community that have been talking to this and promoting this and making this happen for years now. So we're very grateful as a city community, arts community, and uh, wish you all a wonderful weekend. And we'll capture some notes from our chat and we'll have them in the archive going forward of our uh, Studio Dreamin' campaign. So thanks everybody for coming. Anything final from you, Lisa or Diane, before we pull the plug? Yes, thanks very much, Mike, for hosting. This is great and always great to meet with uh, community organizations and also individual um, artists and members who build strong community together. I really do. This is the part of my job that I really love the most. So uh, thank you for your participation today. Today, it really warms my heart that uh, so many of you are so passionate and so involved. And I agree with uh, Lisa on that. And, and thank you, uh, Mike, for hosting today and for all the great feedback and thoughts. It, it was great to hear from everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Bye, you all. Bye, everyone.